aren't you glad we have the Lord to hold on to us and to be there in those times of need and struggles of life itself? Well, as you can see this morning, I'm going to talk about it's later than you think, and I believe that it really is. And over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to look at some things that, that I want to introduce this morning. We've got a lot of scripture, got a lot of things to go, so we need to buckle your seat belts and let's start and let's get going. I promise we're going to get out of here before services start tonight, okay? So, you know. President Barack Obama said in uh, October of 2014 uh, to a fundraiser in New York City, he said there is a sense possibly that the world is spinning so fast that no one is able to control it. That's one thing he said that I actually believe and, and uh, actually uh, think is right and agree with. Uh, the world does seem to be spinning out of control. It just seems to be moving so fast. Just consider some of the headlines that you uh, have heard just over the last few weeks. We, we hear just Friday how a man ran up to a police car in Philadelphia and shot 13 times into it and hit the, uh, the officer three times. And then he said that he did that because that the police and the military were upholding laws that were contrary to the Quran. Just this past week in North Korea, they shot off a missile. And they claimed to have a hydrogen bomb. I don't know what, what they had with it, but they did show us that they had the capabilities of, of firing these missiles. Saudi Arabia and Iran are right at the, 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 the throat of each other in war. And the United States of America seems to be siding with Iran in this situation. Just a few months ago, 147 Christians were mortared in Kenya. And in that same period of time, there were four jihad attacks within four days. ISIS is torturing men and women and children before they behead them. Man, things are spinning out of control. There was an article in the uh, New York Times, and you know that the New York Times is not very Christian-friendly, but the New York Times, written by Roger Cohen, and Roger Cohen called the article The Great Unraveling. He said, and he began by, by it was a time of unraveling. Long afterward, the ruins, uh, it was a time of unraveling. Long afterwards, the ruins people asked, how could it happen? Then he went on several paragraphs, each one starting, it was a time of, and he talked about beheadings and aggressions and breakups and disorientation. And in his last paragraph, he said, it was a time of disorientation, and no one connected the dots until it was too late, and people could see the great unraveling for what it was and for what had been wrought. I agree with him. I think that the, one of the saddest things, and, and, and this is bringing in the, the message this morning, was the fact that we see things happening all around us, but we don't seem to be connecting the dots to see what's really going on. Well, the Bible has a lot to say about this. And I believe that, that uh, in my lifetime, I've never seen so much unrest and so many unhappy people all around. It seems like there's a stress in the, in the air. People are so afraid of what's about to happen. There is, seems like a strong sense of coming into this new year that something very bad is going to happen this new year. Will it be that there will be another 9-11 style attack? Will it be that there will be a great economic downturn or very deep recession this year? Will it be that ISIS will, have, will create a Muslim uh, caliphate state in the Middle East? Will it be that Ebola or some other serious virus will be spreading uncontrollably across the country? Will Christians be jailed for their faith? Will we ever be able to trust our government again? Is the world unraveling before our eyes and seem like it's spinning out of control? Dr. David Jeremiah, the pastor of Shadow Mountain Church, said the events unfolding in today's world are ominously threatening to unsettle institutions, reorder national political alignments, change the balance of world power, and destabilize the equitable distribution of resources. Pe people everywhere are living in fear and anxiety all around the world. 
the uncertainty of what tomorrow is going to bring. Serious people are asking if this is the kind of headlines we're reading today, what on earth is it going to be like for our children and our grandchildren? What on earth is the world going to be like in just a, a few short years? Do current headlines give us any kind of indication as to what's going to happen? Well, I think they do. Dr. Dame, James Dobson, after speaking about the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and relating it to what all is happening in America today, uh, he wrote, Why have I chosen to recount this Bible story from so long ago? Because I am convinced that America and other Western nations are sliding in the same direction. We have not yet reached the depravity of Sodom and Gomorrah, but there, that appears to be where we are headed very fast. Dr. Billy Graham wrote, Today the world is being carried on a rushing torrent of history that is sweeping out of control. There is but one power available to redeem the course of events, and that power is the power of prayer by God-fearing, Christian-believing people. He continued, Even though America is just as wicked as Sodom and Gomorrah ever was, and as deserving of the judgment of God, God would spare us if we were earnestly praying with hearts that had been cleansed and washed by the blood of Christ. So let me ask you, if Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by fire and brimstone like the Bible says, what's ahead for America? Well, I believe that all these statements are true. And so that's why I'm starting this these series of messages. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at uh, some of the, the headlines, some of the things that are un uh, headlines, rather not headlines, but headlines, and some of the things that are unfolding all around us and, and see what the Bible has to say. The Bible does have a lot to say about it. As a matter of fact, most of what has happened was predicted in the Bible in prophecy. The rise of ISIS and radical Islam, the increasing persecution of Christians around the world and even in America today, the increasing moral disorder that we find in attempts to redefine what marriage really is. All these things were prophesied thousands of years ago, and we find them written in the Bible. I don't pretend to have any idea about God's clock in his time. I don't pretend to tell you I know when the end is coming, but I believe with all my heart that we are, it's a whole lot later than we think it is, that we are moving there very, very, very quickly according to what is unfolding around us. It is desperate times. Well, how important is prophecy? I believe prophecy is very important. Some people choose to ignore prophecy saying that, well, they had rather spend their time on thinking about things that they can put into practice right now and live their life. Well, prophecy teaches us such that we should put in practice and how to live our life. Others will say, we, we can't th change things anyway. It's on a set destiny. So why even think about it? Why even bother ourselves with it? Let me give you two responses to that. Number one, warnings are very important. If you'll remember just a couple of weeks ago, we came to church on a Sunday night and tornadoes began to go. And while we came in the building, there was about uh, five or six who actually got here. And all of a sudden, everybody's cell phone began to buzz and warnings began to come across the cell phone. If you had your television on, there were all kinds of warnings about the weather that was coming along or the radio. If you were listening to the radio, there were all kinds of warnings coming on. Why did they waste our time with warnings like that? It's because it was important, right? I mean, there were storms coming and there was reason to believe that they were headed our direction. So these warnings came that we might protect ourselves and that we might be on the watch out for so that we could do what is ne necessary to make it through to that time or through that place. Well, I believe that the prophecies in God's Word are exactly the same thing. I believe that the warnings that God gave us are, are, were given so that we might know the signs of the, the time and the area around us so that we might get prepared and so that we might get serious about the things of God. You say, now, Pastor, what, what on earth do we need to do to get prepared? 
But of course, first thing you need to do is you need to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, your personal Savior. If that's not sure in your heart right now, you need to make that sure. I mean, you need to get a grip on that. But then beyond that, you need to be aware of how urgent the time is. We need to be sharing Jesus with the world, don't we? We need to be telling folks that they need to be saved, that, that we want them to know what we know in the safety and security of our Lord and Savior so that they might have their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life and be prepared for this time as well. The time is at hand. The fields are widened to harvest and the laborers are few. Time to wake up and share the message of the gospel with a world who so desperately needs it. Well, it's the same thing with the warnings in the Bible about Jesus is coming again. We need to get prepared. We need to make Him a focus. We need to make Him a priority in the way that we live and the things that we do. And those who aren't prepared are going to face a very significant judgment. The Bible is very clear about that. Well, another reason to look at prophecy is because of its significance in Scripture. When I was in school and was studying about the, in Bible study, uh, there was we were taught about the law of uh, significance or the law uh, of uh, uh, sig yeah, law of uh, proportion. Law of proportion. The law of proportion means that you can see how important a subject is to God by how often He talks about it in His Word. When you think about the second coming and prophecies concerning the second com coming, 25% of the Bible is predictive prophecy. In the Old Testament, there are over 1,800 references to the second coming of Christ and over 300 references in the New Testament to the second coming of Christ. For every prophecy in the Bible about His first coming, there are eight about His second coming. I think that the second coming of Christ and the prophecy of the second coming of Christ is, is very important to God and should be very important to us. Jesus is coming again. Do you believe that? Amen. And over and over and over again in His Word, He tells us that He is coming again and that we need to be prepared. He's coming back. Get ready. Let me show you in His Word where He tells us. Luke chapter 21, verse 7, he said, So they asked him, saying, Teacher, but what will these things be? What will be these things? And that was the, his apostles talking to him. And uh, what, he's, what they're asking is, Lord, when are you going to set up your kingdom? We've all been waiting for you to run Rome out and get on the throne and rule in peace and tranquility like, like we have been taught. They didn't understand the gap between the first coming and, and, and his second coming. So they're saying, tell us about the signs uh, about your kingdom, your coming kingdom, when, when they'll be. And what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? And he said, take heed that you not be deceived. For many are going to come in my name saying, I am he, and the time has drawn near. Therefore, do not go after them. But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified. For these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. And that's extremely important, that uh, the end will not come immediately. We all know that there have been wars and rumors of wars for many years, actually since the history of time, or recorded history of time. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, the kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences. And there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift your heads because your redemption draws near. Amen. 
He said, man, there's some signs, and we're going to go over the next few weeks, and we're going to look at these signs and, and look at uh, some five different signs that I believe that the Lord gave us here uh, that we can look around and see how things are beginning to unfold. The only way to be looking is to be aware of the fact that He's coming. So I hope you have come to grips with, I hope you're absolutely clear in your mind and in your heart that Jesus is coming again. That's what He promised. That's what's going to happen. I hope you believe that as the Bible has given prophecies about the concern in this, that those prophecies are going to be fulfilled exactly like they were given. Exactly like they were given. We know that, and I can say that boldly this morning, because every prophecy that has already been fulfilled, and many have already been fulfilled, all of them have been fulfilled right down to the very letter of it, the smallest letter of that prophecy, exactly like it was given. Many of them had parts of prophecy that didn't even make sense. God wanted us to know and understand, I do what I say I'm going to do. Amen. And He does. And He's going to do it here as well. In Thessalonians chapter 5, he talks again. Paul talks again about this. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. I, I tell you, I am glad that Jesus told us that when He's coming, it's going to happen like that. We won't know just immediately. We know He's coming, but we won't know immediately. I've been thinking about that a lot as I've studied this. And I think, you know, it's going to be... We're going to be walking along. Things are going to be serious. We're going to look at the, the serious times around us. But we're going to be walking along, and we're going to take a breath, and the next breath we'll have a brand new body looking at Jesus in the face. Amen. Isn't that great? Amen. For when they say peace and safety, then suddenly destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. It hits, and it, then it hits harder. And they get faster and they get faster and they get faster and they get harder and they get harder and harder. At least that's what I've been told. <laughs> and that's what it's going to be like in the end of time. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should not overtake you as a thief. He, he's saying, I want you to understand this. I want you to know that this is a reality, that this day is coming. Keep that in mind. Keep that foremost on your mind. Let that guide you. Let that comfort you. Let that strengthen you. Let you know that the things that you are facing here are only temporary. Only for a short period of time concerning eternity. He's coming. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not uh, uh, the night nor the darkness. You know, you have been given the light. You have understanding. You have the promise, if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that Jesus is coming back. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Okay, he says, you know I'm coming back. Take it seriously. Be watching. Understand it could come just any minute. We don't know what time. We don't know the hour, but we know He's coming. Be prepared at all times for the coming of our Lord and Savior. God wants us to be alert about what's going on and to see the signs of the time. It's really important to keep up with what's going on. How important is prophecy? Well, it was important enough that God spent most of the Bible, or the biggest part of the Bible, talking about His coming back again. Okay, so, so when is all this happening? Well, no one knows the date. Jesus said over in Matthew chapter 24, He said, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Jesus said, I don't even know what, when, I'm com when He's coming back. Now, that's a sermon for another reason. That's another day for the reason he didn't know. But he's saying right now as he's talking here on earth, he didn't know the day. Only God himself knows. It's foolish to try to put a date on something that we're told that we can't know. But it's something that people have tried to do all through history. Matter of fact, Christopher Columbus, he prophesied that in 1566 that the Lord would come again. 
Martin Luther, the great reformer, the one who came out of the Catholic Church with his letter of reformation, uh, he predicted that some, the world wouldn't last 300 years past his death till the Lord came back. You may remember radio evangelist Harold Campy Jr. just a few years back. He announced that he had come up with the date that Jesus was coming back on May the 21st, 2011. He encouraged everyone who listened to him and followed him to sell everything they own and to send all the money together, put all their money together. They did, and they bought billboards all across the United States of America. And these big billboards said that Jesus is coming back on May the 21st, 2011. It didn't happen. His testimony was worthless because he tried to put a date on something God said we couldn't know about. Amen. If he had to stop with the fact that Jesus is coming again, I think this discredits not only his testimony, his ministry, but I think it discredits, it gets people to thinking that, well, this isn't serious. People have been talking about Jesus coming back for thousands of years now and Man, it hadn't happened yet. It's not something that's going to happen in our lifetime. Well, we may see some times around us or signs around us, but that, that doesn't mean anything. It means a lot. Again, let me classify that and say that to God a day is as a thousand years and the night is as a thousand years, right? In other words, time is nothing to God. We know we're drawing closer and we know we're drawing closer and we know we're drawing closer. But as we look at the signs that he gave and as we look at the signs that he listed from a biblical perspective, they are being fulfilled all around us. It's time to be aware. It's time to, to, to start being prepared, first through salvation and then through the life that we live, taking on that that is really important and making it important in our lives as a priority. Well, Peter warned against this. He said in 2 Peter chapter 3, Knowing this, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So it's, not correct to try to put a date on it. Just understand and know that it's a reality in the fact that He's coming. Mockers will say that Jesus isn't coming back. We've heard this for some 2,000 years and there's been no sign of His return. He hadn't come back yet. Well, Jesus is coming back again. How do you know that? 1,800 prophecies tell me He's coming back again. In the Old Testament, 23 of the 27 books in the New Testament tell me that Jesus is coming back again. Okay. We can't know the date. Why talk about it? Why well, we can't know the exact time. God knows us, wants us to know the times. Can't put a finger on the exact date on the calendar. But you can tell we're moving closer and closer by the times that we are living in. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5 to be sober. In other words, take it seriously. Be watching and looking. Billy Graham once said, when I look at the world's events, I do so with a newspaper in one hand and the Bible in another. What he's saying is, I'm aware of the things that's going on in the world, and then I look to see how they apply to what God said about what's going to happen in the world around us. Well, what did Jesus say about the end times? Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when these things will be again. Tell us when you're going to set up your kingdom. And what will be the signs of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus, we want to know when to look for you. He said, look for me all the time. I mean, don't give up looking on for me. Look every day. Skeptics would say these signs have been around for thousands of years, but it still hadn't happened. Next Sunday, we're going to look at the rapture. What does that mean? What is it? What's going to take place? Two weeks, we're going to look at the Bible and the rise of radical Islam. What's different about signs today? 
I believe in studying God's Word that the most significant sign of the time, and one reason I believe that it's closer than we think it is, is the rise of radical Islam in the world. The Bible predicts this. The Bible tells us that Iran, mentioned it by name, will, will invade the nation of Israel and it will move into to these latter days or into these latter times. It's very serious. It's time to get serious about it in our lives and in our hearts. With the soon coming nuclear Iran that we are helping to finance, the Bible talks about Iran becoming this, this, this strong force and in invading Israel. They will become the first Muslim nation to have nuclear capabilities. I think it indicates that the end is drawing really close. I believe another sign is the escalating persecution of Christians. Not just around the world, but in America as well. These people say, well, that's been around forever. You're right, it has. Even the, the disciples, even the apostles uh, were persecuted for Christianity. Open Door USA, who studies Christians around the world and what's going on in Christian life, records that... Uh, Persecution of Christians was higher in 2014 than it has been in well over 20 years. ISIS has come into a lot of villages and they'll ask a person if they will, will accept the Muslim faith or if they're Christians, if they won't accept the Muslim faith, they will torture them and cut their heads off. Or they'll take their children and cut their children's heads off in front of the parents. And on camera, they'll take the severed heads and they'll kick them around like it's a soccer ball to play for the camera. Persecution is not the only thing happening around the world. That's the kind of evil perpetrated by radical Islam against Christians and Jews. But in the U.S., seeds of persecution are being planted being forced to bake a wedding cake for a same-sex marriage is not the same as being beheaded. And I'll tell you that's, that for sure I agree with that. But the attitude in both allow for persecution exactly the same way. That's what we're seeing around us. Let me remind you something from history that happened. The nation of Germany, when they came in and began to, to, to persecute the Jews, they could not come in and immediately take all Jews to the crematory and could not put them in concentration camps. So what they did was they began to minimalize, marginalize the Jews. They began to talk with disdain and contempt about who the Jews were. These people are different from us. These people have radical ideas. These people look at things differently than we are. They, they are an inferior group. They have strange beliefs, and because of their strange beliefs, they don't have the right to speak their beliefs like everyone else does. Once you've marginalized a group from society, then society doesn't mind taking away their rights. You can see it through history. Think about it. I believe that's what's happening right now in America concerning Christians. We are being belittled. We are being saying that what we believe is hate-mongering. It is, uh, it, it is uh, silly teachings that it, we are bigots and we are homophobes if we're against same-sex marriage. And therefore, we shouldn't have the same First Amendment rights that other people have. You can debate the merits of gay marriage all you want to. In a secular society, it's going to be around, and it's going to be around from now on. But we understand that as Christians, the secular world doesn't know, and it lets you know which, and when you look at it, it lets you know which churches are secular and which churches are spiritual. Any church that would stand up from something that the Bible so openly and plainly declares as a sin as being all right and even endorse it in their leadership is a secular body. It is not a church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't care what kind of name they put on the outside of it. Amen. 
Here's something that even secularists can't deny. Traditional marriage has been a foundation in Christianity and Judaism for well over 2,000 years. Marriage has been affirmed by our judiciary system here in the United States for the past 200 years. It was the belief of Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton until just a few years ago when they evolved, or rather devolved, into another way of thinking. Everybody has the right to change their way of thinking. We live in America. It's still a free society, or at least it is for a little while. And those who have devolved in their thinking, they have the right to think that about gay marriage. But they do not have the right to take away my First Amendment rights and saying what I believe based on the Word of God. Those who believe that our forefathers gave their blood for the right of people to hold to their religious freedoms. Time to stand. It's time to be bold. Well, there's a, we'll talk about a new moral disorder in the world. 2 Timothy chapter 3. But know this, that in the last days perilous, perilous times will come. In the NIV there, uh, it translates perilous times as uh, terrible times. Both words mean it'll be times without moral restraint. Boy, isn't that where we're getting to real fast in America? No moral restraint whatsoever. In this message, we're going to be looking at two shifting attitudes over the next few weeks. Two shifting attitudes to the point of this time that he's talking about in 2 Timothy. In the final message, we're going to answer the question of, so what? <laughs> what does that mean to me today? What do we do as Christians? The Bible tells us about a group of people called the sons of Issachar. And the sons of Issachar, uh, it was said of them in the Bible, they were men who understood their time and knew what Israel should do. It's the time of the, that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ stand up and understand their time and know what God wants His people to do. Amen. And do it. I believe God wants us to be people who understand the times and live so that we should know what we, uh, what we should be doing for God, what pleases God. We should be evangelizing and sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to pray, but we also need to put feet to our prayers and do something about it. Now, I know this sounds somewhat doom and gloom, Let me, let me just say, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, you have a responsibility to go to the polls and vote and to vote for someone who openly will tell you that they believe in religious freedoms. Amen. Not having to be pushed to make that statement, but who will boldly stand and make that statement. I know it sounds pretty doom and gloom, but it's not. Really, it's not. Quite the contrary. We know Jesus is coming back, right? Yeah. We know that before He comes, He's going to remove all believers to be with Him Amen. while the worst of the persecutions go on here on earth. He's going to remove all true believers. And even though there could be some difficult times before He removes us, the side of Jesus. <laughs> when we wake up, that moment changed and looking at Jesus in the eyes. The side of Jesus will be the greatest event in your entire life. Luke chapter 21 tells us, now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift your head because your redemption draws nigh, draws near. So here's the big question. Are you ready? Amen. I am. 
Do you know that you know that you're saved? You can. And if you are saved, are you where the Lord wants you to be? Are you being found faithful? Is your life an example of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ in a dark world who so desperately needs to know about Jesus? Are you sharing your faith? as God opens the door and gives you opportunity? Are you living in a way and involved in things that would please Jesus as if He, could come, as if, if he would come back today? Because He very well could. Would you stand? Brother Jerry's going to come and lead us in a verse of invitation. God is speaking in your heart. We invite you to come as we sing. Just as I...